Hi, um, I'm Greg Roddy Smith from William & Mary. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, Hill's Diagrammatic Method. Hi, my name is Greg Conradi Smith from William & Mary and this is a short presentation on Hill's Diagrammatic Method. So, Hill's Diagrammatic Method. So, basically the problem that Hill, this is Terrell Hill, my advisor's advisor, um, the problem that he was thinking about was if you had a Markov chain model of um, the conformational uh, states of a macromolecule and how they sort of flipped between one another. So you're thinking of a, a system of isomerization reactions, right? So a protein might have four different conformations um, that it's flipping between and maybe the state space kind of looks like this where you can, the, the labeling of the conformations with numbers is arbitrary but um, what this diagram is saying is that there's no way to go from confirmation four directly to confirmation two. You have to go through confirmation three and so on. So a picture like this um, is sort of standing in for a slightly more complex picture, which is really the transition state diagram of a Markov chain that has this structure. So um, I'll put arrows that go back and forth like this. Okay, so uh, in this case, we just have a, a graph. In this case, people call it a directed graph. And we'll refer to this undirected graph as the topology of this directed graph. This is the type of directed graph is referred to as being symmetric in, in the sense that every reaction has its, um, its reverse reaction present. Now, it's always going to be possible, if you number the states with integers, to just think about the rate constants associated with these transitions in the following way. So this would be um, the transition rate alpha 1, 2, right? where it's the rate of transition from state 1 to state 2. So they would have units of reciprocal time and this one, for example, would be alpha 2 to 3, and so on, right? Um, and then there's um, dynamics of probability where we'll have the rate of change of the probability of being in state 1 equals, well, there's a loss at the rate alpha 1, 2 times pi 1, p1. And um, there's a gain of probability at the rate alpha 2, 1 times p2, and so on. There'll be two terms that come from the fluxes in from state 3 and out from state 1 to state 3, and so on. So if you wrote down all these equations, there'd be four of them from p1 to p4, and this set of equations has a property where if you add them all up, you'll get zero on the right-hand side. Okay. Um, that means that actually the last equation is not independent of the others. Um, and furthermore, you can take all of these rate constants and put them in a matrix that we call the generator matrix. So I'm going to use the um, notation Q for the generator matrix. And then I'll write 1, 2, 3, 4 for my states. 1, 2, 3, 4. And then I'll just fill in the matrix such that, um, you know, the rate like alpha 1 to 2 would be in row 1, column 2. Alpha 1, 2. This would be the rate alpha 1 to 3 and so on. So I'm going to fill this one out completely. So 2 can go to 3, right? So this is 
alpha 2, 3, 2 can go back to 1, alpha 2, 1, 3 can go to 1, alpha 3, 1, 4 can go to 3, alpha 4, 3. I'm going to put stars here in this diagonal to explain. I'll explain what that means in a second. 4 can only go to 3, alpha, um, alpha, sorry, 3 can only go to 4, alpha 3, 4. There's big fat zeros here, here, and here. Okay, so if you just, um, now we'll remove these indices here and just make it clear that we're thinking of this as a 4 by 4 matrix. Now, the meaning of the stars is that in this particular element, um, e each star is whatever value you would need to make the sum in this direction equal to zero. So, for example, this star is equal to minus 3, 1, minus alpha 3, 4, and so on. Okay. <clears throat> so if we take this matrix and multiply it on the left by um, a um, row vector, so P underscore is a column vector, P1, P2, P3, P4, but then I put the transpose and now it's a row vector. If I multiply that times Q, um, when um, that, that's essentially the right-hand side of this um, set of equations equals P, rate of change, transpose. Okay. So this set of equations over here is equivalent to this little matrix equation. Now usually we're thinking of P as being probabilities, so um, the, the probabilities will have to add up to one. So uh, one way of writing that is to say that the sum over each index i of pi has to be 1. Another way of saying the same thing is that um, if you take this row vector of probabilities and multiply it by a column vector of 1s, that inner product will end up giving you 1. You're saying the same thing. <clears throat> this fact that the probabilities add up to 1 or that you have conservation of probability in the ordinary differential equation of system is a system is um, related to the fact that the last equation here is not independent of the others. All right. So what Hill's diagrammatic method is going to be about is looking for steady states of systems of this kind. All right. So at steady state, we have 0 equals P transpose times Q. Right? This is also, this zero is a row vector. Um, and we'll also have the condition that P transpose times a column vector of ones is equal to one. Right? So if you take these two, the, the sort of linear algebraic system given by these two equations, um, this, if, if Q is M by M, this will have rank M minus one, and this is the other. Um, necessary condition to get a solution. Okay, now there's many ways to get solutions to the steady state dynamics of probability in a Markov chain model of this type. And um, we're not going to concern ourselves right now with numerical calculations of steady states. Hill's like that diagrammatic method is an analytical technique and it works on, um, it's, it's a nice technique to learn because it's useful when you have simple examples and you can work out the answer really quick by hand. So. There will always be, <clears throat> um, we'll sort of represent our model using the undirected graph. And
and for argument's sake, to start out, just to make things simple, um, I'm going to use this model to begin with. Okay, three states that have this configuration. Right. So now, the way Hill's diagrammatic method works is that we're looking for a probability of being in state one, state two, and state three at steady state. And so, what we'll do is just think of the spanning tree of this graph rooted in each of those three states. So the spanning tree, I'll call it capital T, associated with the state I, um, the rooted spanning tree, <laughs> the spanning tree associated with the state 1, right, um, has an arrow going this way and an arrow going this way. Right? So this is the um, this tree I would call uh, T1, and then we can write down T2 and T3 very quickly. So T2 would have this structure, and T3 would look like this. Okay. So in each case, we have a spanning tree of the graph, um, and we have these directed arcs um, set up so that uh, the, the tree has a root in whatever vertex that we're thinking about. And the theorem from Hill's diagonatic method, um, sometimes referred to as uh, Kamolgarhaw's matrix tree theorem, right, um, is that the probability at steady state of being in any one of these states, right, is equal to the tree value divided by the sum of all the trees. Now, when I put a t like this here in an algebraic expression, what I mean is that the product of the rate constants that are indicated in the diagram. So this would be the, the rate constant for this arc is alpha um, state 3 to state 2, and this one is alpha state 2 to state 1. This is alpha 1, 2. This is alpha 3, 2. This is alpha 1, 2, and alpha 1, 3. Okay? So each tree is going to be a monomial that has two factors, right? In this case, there'll be three trees, and what this is telling me, for example, is that the probability of being in state one is alpha two one, alpha three two, divided by alpha two one, alpha three two, plus alpha one two, alpha three two, plus alpha one two, alpha one three. You can see that the condition that these probabilities have to add up to one is going to be satisfied because we have all of the possible numerator values being summed together here in the denominator. So when you add them all up, you'll get one. <clears throat> and um, it, it's uh, an important theorem, like I said, uh, it's called the um, Markov tree theorem, the Markov chain tree theorem, that, that this always works. Now, the complication is a little bit harder um, in general than this picture that I just drew, because when I say that we want the spanning tree associated to each vertex, I sort of, in, in this problem, there's only one spanning tree rooted in each vertex. But, in a, uh, for example, if I went back to our original problem, where it looked like this, um, if I want to think about the spanning trees rooted in vertex 1, right, there'd be, um, there'd be three different ones. So, a spanning tree is um, not going to have a cycle, right? Um, so let me draw three different undirected graphs um, that don't have cycles that span this graph here. So there's this one, this one, and this one. Okay. The cycle has three edges. I can get a spanning tree by removing any one of the edges. And these are the three unrooted undirected spanning trees. But now I'm going to root these trees in each of the vertices. So if um, I rooted uh, 
well, let, let me draw f a c four of these, right? Because I can root in any one of the four vertices. So if I'm talking about um, vertex 1, then the spanning tree rooted in vertex 1 looks like that. In this case, it looks like this. And here, the spanning tree looks like that. If I'm rooting in vertex 2, this spanning tree, this edge is flipped. It's in the opposite direction. If I'm rooting in vertex 3, I get this. And rooting in vertex 4, looks like this. Okay, now remember that each one of these rooted spanning trees of our graph um, corresponds to a monomial. For example, this one corresponds to the monomial that would have factors alpha 2 1, alpha 3 2, and alpha 4 3. Okay? So that would be easy to write down for each of these. And then the, um, the weight uh, associated to each vertex that we're going to use is actually the sum of all these monomials. So it's the sum of the weights of all the root spanning trees rooted at a given vertex. So um, our probability, for example, of being in state one, right, is going to have these three terms on top. So it'll be, it'll be like alpha 2, 1, alpha 3, 2, alpha 4, 3. Um, then there'll be the monomial of three terms associated with this tree. So I'll just write it like this. And then a monomial of three terms associated with that tree. Okay. And then it'll be divided by um, three times four or 12 terms, right? All of the monomials that are in this picture here. <clears throat> So what's, what's cool about this is that the probabilities of the different states of the Markov chain model um, can be calculated analytically as a function of the model parameters in this sort of simple kind of geometric or graph theoretic kind of fashion. Um, if you were doing this in a computer um, using something like SageMath, you could ask SageMath for all the rooted directed spanning trees in each vertex. Um, sometimes people call these arborescences. And um, you could also, um, using symbolic calculation in MATLAB, say, um, if you just take, uh, if you take your generator matrix, right? Remember, this had this form of um, alpha, alpha 1, 2, there was these negative numbers here, right, and so on. So here, um, let me fill this out. Alpha 1, 2, alpha 1, 3, 0, alpha 2, 1, um, uh, alpha 2, 3, 0, alpha 3, 1, alpha 3 to 2, alpha 3, 4, alpha 4, 3, 0, 0, okay? So there's our generator matrix, and remember the star is the opposite of whatever's in that particular row. So like this star is just minus um, alpha 4, 3. 
So um, if you, uh, it's um, kind of astonishing fact that if you're interested in um, the, uh, these tree polynomials, um, one of the ways that you can find them is to simply uh, like cancel out, um, sort of remove the row and column associated with the given vertex and then take the determinant. So if you were interested in um, the, the, the tree polynomial for state two, right, you take this Q matrix and uh, you don't eliminate um, the row two and column two. So it's just a notation. Let's say this means that you're eliminating row two and column two. So that's taking, scratching this out, scratching that out. And now you have this three by three matrix of what remains. And then we're just going to take the determinant of that matrix. And you'll actually get this polynomial up to sign. So if you want to calculate quickly the tree polynomial for a Markov chain, you just write down the Markov chain as create it in the computer as a symbolic object, and then write a for loop that goes through every state, removes that row and that, row, that column, takes the, the, the remaining values, puts that into a matrix that has one less dimension, and um, a rows and columns, and then calculate the determinant, make sure everything's positive. Okay, that was just a sketch of this technique. If, um, uh, there's a lot more that can be said, and uh, you can easily find um, in the lab web page um, the materials that would direct you to more of a description. So that's a quick um, introduction to the idea of Hill's diagrammatic method, and um, you can search on Terrell Hill, um, and you'll find three or four books that he's written that go through this in detail. Thanks.